got Makui, Kina is running around somewhere. I'm also joined by Kelly and Celia. Uh, Kelly might be helping me out with some of my blog today. So we are just a couple weeks away from... Hi, thank you. <laughs> Pause that thought. <laughs> We are just a couple weeks away from uh, voting. <laughs> oh, I know. Voting on November 3rd. So I wanted to do uh, one more vlog about Proposition 114. Hopefully answer some of those biggest questions and concerns that are out there. So... Proposition 114 is a proposal to have Colorado Parks and Wildlife put together or develop a plan to reintroduce wolves to about 17 million acres of public space in Colorado. They will uh, use a science-based plan. They will also take in the input of all the public that is involved to create a plan that fits best for everyone. So there are currently about 600,000 wolves living in the wild throughout the world, about 6,000 wolves living in the lower 48 states. There are about 150... <laughs> there are about 150 Mexican gray wolves on the border of New Mexico and Arizona about 30 in Mexico, and then there are seven wolves in, or red wolves in North Carolina. Wolves were put on the endangered species list in 1974, and Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, parts of Washington, Oregon, and Utah have delisted them, so they are no longer protected, but in Colorado, wolves are protected under, under the Endangered Species Act. Mexican gray wolves are a smaller subspecies of the gray wolf. They differ a little bit in their physiology, but uh, because the current Mexican gray wolf populations are small, so small, if they were to interbreed with other gray wolves, it could decrease the gene pool or the more pure Mexican gray wolf genes, which could cause a problem for future generations. But once the Mexican gray wolf populations got larger, it would actually help to increase genetic diversity and keep them healthy to have interbreeding between other wolf populations. Wolves lived in Colorado for a very long time before humans arrived here, and in 1940 we killed off the last wild wolf. Now there have been a few documented cases of lone wolves wandering through the state, but they have all met the same fate, which is death. Beginning of this year, there were six wolves spotted, or a pack spotted, in northern Colorado, which was very exciting news. Unfortunately, just a couple weeks ago, three of them were found dead in Wyoming. So currently, there are no established packs in Colorado, and we are not sure how many lone wolves there are. But Colorado, in Colorado, wolves are still protected by the Endangered Species Act and owned by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Currently, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has management over any wolves that do end up in Colorado. If Proposition 114 goes through, Colorado Parks and Wildlife would be in charge of developing a plan to reintroduce wolves. They would have to get permission from U.S. Fish and Wildlife to do so. Once that plan was approved by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, then Colorado Parks and Wildlife would be in charge of that process. Commission and Colorado Parks and Wildlife have not come up with a formal resolution for Proposition 114. Colorado has some of the largest ungulate or hoofed animal populations in the United States. We also have about 17 million acres of public land uninhabited by humans, with a big portion of that being uh, in the Rocky Mountains. So Colorado does have plenty of pristine land for wolves. Wolves that are currently in Colorado are not enough. 
They're not enough to form a healthy viable pack, let alone a healthy viable population. It's also uncertain whether or not they're going to stay here. The wolves that have been spotted have been very close to bordering states and it is likely that they are roaming throughout those states. It is also likely that for them to get shot when they do enter those nearby states. So it is going or we have a better chance of forming a healthy, viable population for the entire state if we do a reintroduction. The risk of humans being killed by wolves is very low. In Alaska and Canada, over the last 100 years, there have been 16 cases of wolves biting people. 12 of those were confirmed to have rabies. In the lower 48 states in the last 150 years, there have been zero human deaths by wolves. Wolves are very shy, cautious animals and are generally going to avoid people, so that risk is very minimal. The wolves, like any predator, can be harmful to pets. It is very unlikely for wolves to attack dogs. Most cases where wolves do go after dogs, they are hunting dogs that are out in wolf territory. So it is very unlikely that this will be a problem. Wolves are a keystone species, meaning they have a very big impact on their ecosystems. So wolves can help control prey populations that can do a lot of damage to various types of shrubs and trees. Without those shrubs and trees, there is habitat loss for various types of birds and small mammals like beavers. Beavers are actually uh, ecosystem engineers and play a very important role as well. So wolves help to control that cascading effect from happening and they do show signs of having a lot of uh, positive effects on the ecosystem. Wolves are unlikely to have a large impact on the big game or hunting industry. Uh, in states where wolves are present and in large populations, there has still been very successful hunter harvests every year. And Colorado does have a very large ungulate population. So at a statewide level, the impact will be very minimal. At the local level, you will see a little more of a decline in those populations. Moose are not a normal prey choice for wolves. They are very large and can be very dangerous. In places where moose and wolves live together, wolves and other predators are a very minimal cause of death for moose. Chronic wasting disease is a fatal disease in the ungulate population. It is present in Colorado. Now, because wolves hunt the weak and the sick animals, it is likely that they are going to end up catching and consuming the prey that does have chronic wasting disease. Wolves are capable of eating that and it is not going to affect them. So models suggest that wolves will help decrease the chronic wasting disease population as well as decrease the spread. The hydrated disease is caused by tapeworms and this disease has already been present in Colorado in some of our moose populations back in 2017 before there were wolf populations. So it's unlikely that wolves are going to increase the prevalence of this disease. Uh, it is found in ungulate populations, in livestock, in both wild and domestic canines. And so <clears throat> the transfer of this disease to humans happens most often through the livestock and domestic dog population. It is very rare to happen through the wild canines or through our ungulate populations. The cases of hydated disease in humans are very rare across the world and there have been no reported cases that have been caused in the United States. There are very easy basic precautions you can take to avoid if this is a concern to you. Uh, number one, don't eat wolf poop. Number two, don't handle wolf poop. Uh, if you are a hunter and you are dressing carcasses, wear gloves. If you take dogs out in the wild, don't let them eat wild animal poop and deworm your dogs often. 
because wolves and dogs are very closely related, they can share the same diseases. Rabies, parvovirus, and distemper can be found in both wolves and dogs, but it is more likely that our dogs are going to transmit that to wolves than wolves are going to get it, or than wolves are going to give it to our dogs. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service reported that uh, 400 roughly cattle were killed by wolves and about 100 cat, uh, sheep were killed by wolves. Whereas NAS reports that about 2,800 cattle were killed by wolves and about 400 sheep were killed by wolves. Now, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service likely underestimates the depredation numbers, while NAS likely overestimates depredation numbers. So, a model put together both of these numbers and found that wolves account for about 1% of livestock depredation. So, the overall economic cost of wolves to cattle is minimal. So this is referred to as surplus or excess killing. And the reason this happens is because prey is very scarce for wolves or more so hunting is very difficult. Uh, wolves are not very successful at hunting. They only catch their prey 15 to 20% of the time. So it's feast or famine for them. So if they get the opportunity and they come upon a herd of elk or deer that has been very weakened by a rough winter or something like that, they may take advantage of that and kill more of those animals than they are going to eat at that time. But uh, research studies and observation all has shown that as long as humans leave those carcasses alone, wolves will come back again for months afterwards and clean up that entire kill. So they're not wasting any of it. There are a lot of management tools available to help ranchers prevent livestock depredation whether it be physical barriers, guardian dogs, humans around because wolves are less likely to approach when there are humans, changing grazing strategies so livestock are not in wolf territory, and removing dead carcasses of livestock because that's definitely going to attract more wolves. So when it comes to ben economic benefits, we have consumptive and non-consumptive. So consumptive would be hunting wolves. And in the Northern Rocky Mountain areas, about $47,000 uh, were spent annually in hunting licenses for wolves. But in Yellowstone National Park, $400 million were spent annually in non-consumptive. And this is things like wolf watching and going out to view. So in both aspects, whether it be consumptive or non-consumptive uses, Colorado does look to gain economically from wolf reintroduction. So there are a few commercial costs for wolves. One would be on the hunting industry. But as I discussed before, at the statewide level, this is going to have a very minimal impact. It's going to be more at the local level that may have a small impact from that. You're also going to have the cost to the livestock industry, which as I discussed before, is very minimal at an overall level. And then of course, there is the cost for management of wolves. There are government programs to reimburse ranchers for livestock. Uh, most states have their own programs. There are also private organizations and federal grants available for this. Studies show that ranchers don't take as much advantage of this uh, or these programs as they could. But some of the problems with this is the high costs and the burden to try and verify that it is a wolf kill. Um, some people think that rather than reimbursing for loss, that instead uh, ranchers should be encouraged to learn how to live with wolves and then give them proper reimbursement for the tools to be able to do that. So currently Colorado Parks and Wildlife cannot reimburse ranchers for livestock, but if Proposition 114 goes through, then it is required that they form a plan and a fund to be able to do so. 
So a 2019 survey done by Colorado State University found that 84% of 734 Colorado residents were for wolf reintroduction. So this same study found that there was less than 10% difference in yes or no for reintroduction from the Western Slope to the Front Range to the Eastern Plains. They also found either 50% or more of people who strongly identified as hunters and ranchers were in favor of this proposition. The contention comes because people have different views on how wolves are going to impact their ecosystem and the world around them. Now, a lot of this contention is actually driven by some very deep-seated beliefs that have nothing to do with wolves, and that's things like how public man's how public lands should be managed, different cultural beliefs and views of wildlife, and how the economy and the human population is changing over time. But the best way to discuss this is to be open to everyone's thoughts and opinions and give out the proper data and information. And always guys, do your research and please get out there and vote in November. Thank you guys for watching and we'll see you on the next one.